I'm Shantila Ludakia. Uh, I live in Croydon and I arrived in this country in 1968 uh, during the Exodus period. And uh, since uh, I was settled first in uh, Bolton, I st spent about 15 years in Bolton. Uh, and uh, then I moved to London as I uh, got my right job. Originally, I am from Brascourt. And uh, I spent a little bit of my childhood there. I had a chance to go to the school, local school there, on the four five standard. And I managed to learn some Gujarati there as well. And uh, because my parents were there, my father, uh, grandpa uh, grandfather was there, and most of the immediate family, they were all there, you see. So uh, originally the place was Rajkot, and that is the place then we started migration. My grandfather, in early 1930, he went to Malagasy, uh, the French colony near uh, South Africa. He went to settle down there with his uh, relative and friends. And then my father followed them. But uh, that was a long time, and there were no steamer services in those days. They had to go by Tau, as they call it Said, you see. And uh, it took them two and a half months to reach there. Because, you see, ours was a small family, and we were not economically better off, you see. Uh, there was not much work there. And because the family was growing, so my grandfather thought that it's better somebody go overseas somewhere and uh, work hard and feed, make money for the family. So he went. Then my father followed him immediately, within a short time. He followed him and he joined his business there. They were in the tailoring business, making the clothes. People bring the clothes or they, they used to keep some material, and they used to, in those days, there was nothing like uh, uh, big stores, Mark and Spencer and other things. There were no stores in those days. It was a colony, French colony. It was completely a forest land, completely isolated. The population was very little, not much, and there were only a few Indians that living there. So. Then my mother followed him, and we were born there. Four or five children of the family, we were born there. I was born there. Because my father was a good tailor, so he had a lot of French customers. The French settlers, they were there, and they were looking for somebody who can make their stitch their clothes. So my father, in those days, he was quite good at making the suits like this. And uh, he would take the measurement, give them trial. He had the customer, including the district commissioner, the police commissioner, uh, even the, the local judges. They were all his customer. So he used to make clothes ready, make to measure. That was the system in those days. So what happened? My father never went to school. He had very little education. But somehow, he had a gift of learning language, so he learned French language uh, by practice only, talking to the customer. You see, all the French, uh, uh, those people were settlers coming there. And there was a time he used to go to the court as an interpreter even. So that was the level he attained. But uh, the, uh, it makes me surprised these days people that cannot learn one language is it takes them a lot of time. Now, this man, he learned the language, he spoke the language, and he was too good at that. Then later on, after many years, when he went to Saudi Arabia and other places, he learned uh, African, uh, this thing, as Arabic language. He used to speak in Arabic, my father, right? After that, when he went to Africa, he started learning Swahili as well. So he was too good at languages. And because of that natural gift that was given to us as well, 
So, as far as I am concerned, I love the African languages. I stayed there, we used to talk with Africans, only, not only with the servants working at our place, in the bank and other places. And my father had a shop where we used to uh, attend the customers, mostly 90% African customers. And uh, uh, in that way, you have a direct communication with the people, you see. And has to make them laugh, make jokes and everything, you see. And while that language helped me a lot, when I joined the bank in Mombasa, after finishing my education in Mombasa, we had a mobile service going into the district with the mobile bank. And we used to go together, attending about 1,000 customers in one day, talking to them in Swahili, explaining them how to open the account and how to save the money, what interest they get, and all the facilities provided. But in that, if you have a command on the language, you really enjoy. And I really enjoyed. I used to enjoy a lot with them. And the same thing helped me in Nairobi also. When I went to Nairobi, uh, Nairobi branch, we, we had a special Dakota plane, small four-seater plane. We used to take one plane, go to the Kajiado district, talk to the Maasai Africans there, and uh, there's meeting big like a big mela. You see, people get together and uh, they come and discuss and talk and everything. And my experience, I would say, they were really honest. The, the villagers, they were very, very honest people, I would say. They, if you have given, made a mistake, they will come back with a passbook. They said, this is not my money. Even if the money was more there, they would say, no, this is not my money. I have drawn only 200 shillings. Why are you giving me 400? And suddenly when you look at that name, it's a similar name, Jerogi, this and that. And so uh, in that way, it's a, the things were very impressive, you see. They were so innocent people. The Africans living in the city like Momos and Rubin, they were a bit little crafty. But these guys, villagers, I would say, nay, God help them. They are so nice people. I'm, honest. I, I'm very honest people, I must say. Yeah. How do you find, um, you know, you learned so many languages. I was in a bank and you are dealing with the African customers all the time, right? And then in the evening when I was free, I used to go to my father's shop and help him. So there we used to attend the African customer until 10 o'clock in the night. We used to keep the op shop open until 10 o'clock. It was all uh, ready-made goods. We used to manufacture clothes, children wear and ladies wear and gents wear. They would come and buy and, and then there's a lot of bargaining, you see. So a lot of talking is involved. So much talking involved, you have to convince them, you see. You don't allow them to go away without buying. That, that is the trick. About the Gujarati language, um, in Kenya, the education department, they had kept Gujarati classes, Punjabi classes, and uh, uh, Urdu classes. So people of all different religion and different languages, so there were mixed population, uh, the Indians, the Hindus, Muslims, uh, Khoja, Bohra, all the different communities. So whatever their requirement of the language, they were taught in the school. So these subjects were taught, but they were not as much as like uh, English language. We used to have about two or three lessons in a week or four lessons. But even that little bit of education help is helping now. We can write the language, we can read the language, we can talk into that language, you see. And at home, Usually we used to speak Gujarati all the time. And uh, we were brought up in that atmosphere. And uh, because, you see, when, when you live there, you become part of that community, you see. Because my father was a person, he wanted 
looking for adventure all the time. Although he never went to school, but he was fond of go going here and there. So uh, Malagasy, he left Malagasy sometimes in 1940. We were very kids, small. Very, very. He went by steamer to Madras. Then he goes there, he settled down there for a few months. Then he thinks that, no, no, I must go somewhere else. So he comes to Bombay and there was a ship going to Aden, Saudi Arabia in those days, at Yemen, Yemen, it, where is it is now. So there was some goldsmith there, they were staying together in Dharmashala. And they asked, where are you going? So my father said, I have not decided, I am thinking to go somewhere, but I don't know. So they said, no, you come with us, we are going to Eden. There is not a single tailor there, we need a tailor there. So you come with us, you stay with us, we will arrange everything for you. So he changed his mind, he jumps with them. He goes by a, a small steamer, goes to Eden, and he, he has taken his uh, sewing machine with him. He opened the machine and he stayed with one of the family. He started working from home. And there was a queue of people because there was nobody to do this uh, stitching job, tailoring job. So all the Indians that came, the, the Arabs came. Then he started a small shop. And then it, the shop grew up. There was about 15 people working in a very short time. And he was really well established. By the time the Second World War started, and that, that, that was the warning that Eden has to be evacuated. So we were told to go back somewhere. So my father and my uncle, they decided that the family, the children, wife and children, we should go back to India immediately. And uh, they stayed behind, my father and my uncle. They said, we'll carry on with the business uh, as long as we can. And there was already the Italian Somaliland in those days. Uh, so bombardment was going on all the time. So we went by special steamer. The, the Congress in those days, they sent a special ship, a refugee ship. So we went, there were 2,000 people. Suddenly we were told to go. Suddenly. And the husbands were leaving behind, you see, looking after the business. Because they cannot wind up immediately. And un unfortunately, what happened? After, uh, as soon as we landed at Bombay, the bombardment started in Eden. My father wrote to us, the bombardment has started and we are going to wind up the business and we'll come back to India as soon as possible. And within three months, my father and my uncle, they came to India also as well. He started a small business again in Rajkot. He said, I'll carry on. Because he was never afraid of doing any business. He just start working. He said, we get, we get enough money to f feed the family enough. So he started his business and a uh, uh, tailoring business. And I think after two or three years time, again he thought, I must go out. So there was a Dao uh, uh, ship, you know not steamer, from Porbandar, they're living there, and uh, there were 100 people going to Mabasa. So somebody said, let's go to Mabasa. So he jumped into, he said, okay, I will go to Mabasa. He packed up his things, and he, he never knew about Mabasa. He knew nobody there in Mabasa, not a single friend or relative there. So he joins the group, but in the ship, you see, you become friendly with the people. And by the time they landed in Mombasa, it took about a month, more than a month to reach there, you see. The wind was quite good. So, so they managed to find out the place there. And slowly and slowly, there was, in those days, the most beautiful thing was that people were helping each other. There was so much uh, close um, um, uh, support all the time. You see, if you are alone, they say, you don't worry, we'll look up to you. You can eat at our place or you can sleep in one of the rooms, these and, and they were sharing everything, sharing, sharing, sharing. There was so much. So in three years' time, 
my father settled down in Mombasa. He started his business, and he, yeah, in, in in Mombasa, and he made enough money to take us back to Mombasa from India. We we stayed behind for three years. So when the money was ready, he applied for permit, and we went to Mombasa. Then we started our education in Mombasa. But remaining education, I finished in the Mombasa High School, Ali Dinabsar M School, and uh, then I joined the bank. He was one person I will never, never forget. I just worship him. I must say, he, he was one person, he never said, I'm Muslim or I'm Hindu. He said, all Hindus and Muslims are the same. In those days, the, the school is now completing 100 years now. We have a letter from them, the principal. And uh, uh, they are celebrating the centenary of the school. And uh, I did go three years ago. I visited the school. And we took the pictures and everything. It was quite interesting. But this school, it has a magnificent history. The man imported all the stones from Porbandar, the original stones. And that built, the building is built. It is as good as it is now. 100 years old building, but if you see the building now, photographs, it's so much good. And uh, now the school has, it was a primary school, then it became a secondary school. Now it is a college. They have not extended the building. The building is the same. They have converted into the college now. It's quite just on the seaside, you see. I finished there my education. And there's a statue of Ali Dina Visra. And uh, there's one statue in the town center as well. And this man, he had his uh, uh, branches all over the country. I, even in Uganda also. There's a lot of business of Ali Dina Visra. I must say, Ali Dinavisram was one of the early pioneers, very early pioneers. In those days, uh, Shed Nanji Kalidas was there, and uh, so many other pioneers. But this particular man, he, he had no money when he traveled from Porbandar. Somebody brought him in a cart, bullock cart, drove him at the Porbandar. And he comes by ship, uh, Dhau, to Mombasa, without any money, start the business. Now we had about more than 75 branches all over the country. And he built this school in those days, 20 lakh shilling, 100 years ago, which is as good as 20, more than 20 million shilling these days, if you count it in terms of today's money. So uh, that, that is the school. I, I really am proud of that school. I, I can never forget that school. The people there did it because this man, he did a wonderful job. When he started he, he, the school, people from his community, they said, no, you make a Muslim school, separate. We don't want this mixing. He said, no, I'm from Porbandar. I'm Indian. No matter whether you're Muslim or Hindu, all the children will be there. And he did it. He set an example. Because of their skill, yes. he survived everywhere. Yeah. Not only that, but he trained some of our African workers in our shop. He trained them. He taught them how to stitch the clothes, how to cut the cloth. And those guys, they were still remembering. He said, this bana, in a juakazi, in a juakazi He say in Swahili they call it. They say, he knows everything. He can teach anything, he can teach and uh, make things fit for everyone and uh, he's such a good man. The political situation started there, you see, they were In demanding the yeah. independence mm -hmm. and Jomo Kenyatta and other big leaders, they came forward and uh, they were convicted at Kapinguria trial sent to jail for seven years, something like that. And they were released and then he became the president of the country. After that, 
they intro with the good independence, they introduced their own regulation. They said those who wanted to stay in this country, either you take the nationality or we introduce our own system whereby we can issue permit or something like that. So we were given four years time and uh, I thought my children were quite young and at that time the edu education system was getting worse. The British government knew that they were going to leave the country, so they were not much keen to leave yes. the things. They wanted to keep everything in mass, let them sort out, you see. And the Africans were insisting that they wanted to keep their culture and language only. So Swahili was introduced, English was already there, but the other languages had no place. And if you take citizenship, only then you are allowed to carry on the job. So in the bank, uh, we have been told that there is a time for two or three years or four years time. If you take the citizenship, you will be here. So I was told that if you take the citizen, your job is permanent. So I was transferred to Nairobi. Then from Nairobi, I had chances to go to everywhere. But uh, I thought it was not in the interest of my children that I stay there for the sake of my job because the education standard was getting deteriorating and because the children were so young, so by the time they are ready, I can never give them a better education because the amount of money we were getting for the bank, that was not enough to send them to UK or America or India for further education. So because they were young, I thought it's better I sacrifice myself go to UK, take my children with me, there's a free education up to the university level. And that gave me a big advantage, you see. When I had decided to come down here, I was told there's a lot of difficulty in UK. You won't get the right job. It's very difficult. There's a lot of discrimination. People like Enoch you know, Powell, they were there at that time. They were shouting at the top of their voice that these people, they are coming and they're taking our jobs and, and so many things. It was all dirty politics going on all the time. And on the other end, the government of India was not strong enough to support us, you see. So what happened? When, when we came here, you see, we had to pick up any job. There was no job whatsoever. When I applied, for a banking job, I was told, they, well, you can't work in a bank. I was surprised. They said, no, all these people are working in factories. Because in those days, most of the people who had come from India and Pakistan, they were directly working in factories only. And they were not much educated people. So there was no way. They were comparing us with them. But they forgot that this lot from East Africa they are different people. They are coming from special background. They have the quality to offer something. Now we see the fruits. We can see the things, what we can do. The East Africans have done. There was problem, housing problem. If you have children, three, four children, nobody will give you a house. They will say, how many children? This is three, four children. They say, no, no, we don't give. If you are single, it's okay. You can share one room. Otherwise, it was difficult to get a house. Job, the same thing. There, there were no other jobs other than factory, factory work. So in Lancashire, there were 200 mills in Bolton in those days when I had arrived here. And you go to any of the mill, textile mill, the job is there. It was easy to get a job. On the first day when I went there, I was told that you, you pick up any job because if you wanted to bring your family, you need a sponsor. And if you don't have a job, you cannot bring the family here. So I said, I must get a job. So once I get a job, I get a sponsor. Make up a sponsor, send it them to Kenya so they can come here in three, four months time. That's what I did. So immediately, the, I went to Bolton. I stayed with my friend. and. Uh, they all 
go together and they were telling me the same story. They say, here there are no other jobs. Factory job is the only job and you must pick up temporary. Later on you may find it the, the right job. Otherwise, in office you will never get a job. I went to Barclays Bank. I had an account there with them. And I asked one of the clerks, he said, no, 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 you can't work in a bank. I said, I've got 15 years' experience, 15 years' banking done with a British bank. They said, no, no, that was in Kenya, not here. You don't have any experience here. He said, we need somebody who is experienced here. I said, well, the only experience I can get if you give me a job here. So I spent 10 years working in factories, doing 12 hours night. I did seven years, 12 hours night, for seven years. The whole world is sleeping, you are working in the factory. And it, was, it was a hard job, pulling those belts of 200 kilos, you see, on the trolley, put them, you see. I was a banker, it was not my job, you see. Uh, you could, that could drive you mad, you say, when you think it, but then the question of, survival, you see, to bring up the family. But because the children, they were already there, they were uh, progressing well, and very, in a short time, they finished the education, they went to the college, university, they got all the qualification. So when I count those things, that, that is the real bonus for me. I don't regret for working hard. I don't regret to say anything to for anyone. But still, I owe a lot to this country, as we well, see. They have given me something. Otherwise, if I was in Kenya in those days, I could never send my children to UK for higher education. It was very expensive. Only the very rich people from Kenya, they were sending the children here. People, ordinary people cannot send them here. But because I was here, the children had a chance to study they get the education, and they are doing the, my children, my grandchildren also, they are all educated here now. So, uh, in, in that sense, the, the things are changing. But it, for 68 years, for 1968, the things were different. But then, it, as the time went by, the, Pope, the British people, they recognized that these Indian people, they are all right, they were part of the society, and they were just merging with them, working together, and now we can see the result now. It's all positive. They were from the tailoring business, you see, the making the clothes. So, and I used to sit down with them, uh, help them in the shop in, while they were in uh, Mombasa. So I had learned a bit of it, not a lot of tailoring. But that also helped me here. When I came to UK, I was told that there's a lot of machinists required. And if you have an industrial machine, you can be given work at home. So I used to get work at home. We used to manufacture uh, leather bags, plastic bags, and uh, uh, stitching together uh, this thing, uh, uh, vacuum cleaner bags. And so all those things, I bought an industrial machine at home, myself and my wife. We were working on top of the work I was doing in the factory. After factory work, coming home, we got four or five hours time, rather than wasting time, we just sit on the machine, do produce something, make a few quid more, you see. And that, that's the hard work, you see. But again, it was paying, it was paying, you see, because I had done that bit of thing, tailoring, so it helped me. So four generations, three generations, now your children and your grandchildren, they haven't... They, no, they, they haven't got even clue, they cannot even put a thread in the needle. <laughs> uh, you see, they are born as tailor's family, but they are not tailors, they are, they are no more tailors. I am no more tailor, I was a banker. 37 years banking service, my. My total working time for bank is 37 years altogether. The secretary's first is 
सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस टॉलरेंस एंड एक्सेप्ट द सिचुएशन वॉट एवर द सर्कमस्टेंस यू कम इन एक्सेप्ट द चैलेंज एंड डू इट जट्स इट यू हैव टू वर्क हार्ड वर्क हार्ड